Hello, everyone. So for the next hour, we're going to understand why companies in the U.S. are finding greener pastures for the regulatory trials outside of the United States. Now, why is that? Those are important questions. And uh, a lot of people have uh, thoughts about that. So we're going to switch up a little bit. The first presentation is going to be a U.S. company that's going to move its clinical trial, to have its clin clinical trial in Japan. Now, a colleague of many years, and one of our leaders in the, in the field, is our next speaker, Kyle Citrullo, who's the co-founder of the International Perinatal Stem Cell Society, a society that I have um, attended their meetings, and I had the opportunity last year to actually speak at one of their uh, conferences. It's a fabulous group, a group that moves the needle. Kyle is an expert on perinatal stem cells and has over 20 years of experience working in our field, starting his career as a cord blood stem banking field in, back in 2000. He worked for uh, family banks and for public cord blood banks. And early on, he understood the potential of mesenchymal stem cells, medicinal signaling cells, stromal cells, MSCs, it goes with uh, many aliases. He co-founded a company, Oxocell Laboratories, and now a new company, Heiwa Bushido Enterprises. So let me introduce and let's welcome Kyle Citrillo. Coming to my talk, I uh, hope it's some entertaining information for you. And I'd really like to thank Bernie for organizing the World Stem Cell Summit. He does a great job of bringing uh, great speakers together. I, I first attended the, my first World, World um, Summit in 2008, I believe in Wisconsin, which was a great meeting. And Jamie Thompson gave incredible talk about I, IPS cells and really put that on the map for me, uh, which was a great, a great experience. I really saw the, the future uh, of where this, where this field was going to go. Now, I really approach this space as a patient advocate and really looking to get these treatments to patients. And I remember particularly in the 2008 meeting and some of the early meetings, we had a lot of patients that attended these meetings as well. And it was always uh, heartbreaking when they would say, you know, you'd be in the elevator with them and it's an ALS patient. He's, you know, when, when, when is this going to be available? And we always were saying, you know, five years, five years. And now we're 15 years out, and we're still five, 10 years away, at least, from some of these treatments getting to patients. So from my perspective, I've looked at how can we do this from an industry perspective, too. I also am an entrepreneur and, and started a company called Oxisol Laboratories. It's one of the first companies in the world to focus on the, the Wharton's jelly mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, we developed some technologies, and we recently sold those assets, so we no longer have Oxocell. So I started this new company called Hiwa Bushido. And what this company does is it helps companies who are in the, have, you know, preclinical data, strong preclinical data set. It helps them to bring their clinical trials to Japan and do the phase one work in Japan, and then you can leverage a lot of the advantages uh, of the Japanese market. And I'll go through that. And then I'm going to give an example of a, of a US company, uh, Osiris Therapeutics, and their drug, Prochymal, which has been in development for 30 years and is still not approved in the US, although it's been approved in Canada in 2012, New Zealand in 2012, and has a robust market in Japan, um, which now is now owned by Mesoblast, this drug. But I'll, I'm going to go through the story of this drug and give an example of why it is advantageous to work in Japan uh, versus the, the US market. And it's a pretty clear example. And Dr. Arnold Kaplan, who spoke at this conference, is actually the original founder of Osiris. I don't know if he's here today, but he spoke earlier. So Hiwa Bushido means the way of the peaceful warrior. And I think that that's how I approach it. Bushido is the samurai code of ethics and integrity. And Hiwa means peaceful or flower. So this is a really stunning example. An advanced cell therapy 
is how Japan defines any cell therapy that's not more than minimally manipulated. And this is the clinical trials in the United States, 4,009, and this is the approved therapy, 16, since 2008, between 2018 and 2022. And you know, this is just a stark example of all the activity that's going on in this country, but the approvals that are taking place. And of these 16, uh, there has been one recent one uh, that was the Gamita cell. And this is an expanded bone marrow MSC product. Um, but since 2007, Gamita cell had to do a dozen clinical trials to get approval. And that is with priority review, breakthrough therapy, and or 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 uh, orphan drug designation. They still kept sending them back for more and more work. Like 12 clinical trials over the course of 15 years is really not a, a story, of, like a pathway for success for a company. And this company barely survived, and who knows if they're actually going to survive, but they had a, quite a slog, although they did just get approval. And again, this is the example of the 16 approved trials, and of those nine are the same product. They're hematopoietic stem cell cord blood products just from different labs and then the, and the Gamita cell. Four are CAR-T therapies, which are big pharma um, applications, and then there's a four you know, scattering of just sort of random uh, one-off one -off trials. And again, there's been no mesenchymal stem cell products. Although mesenchymal stem cell products are used in the US under a 361 designation, it's just kind of a mess in terms of the, the state of the the state of the industry in the United States. So what if there's another pathway? And what I propose is to leverage the Japanese regulatory framework and to bring your trial to Japan and, and then eventually to package that data and bring it back to the US or to Europe. So the regulatory framework, and I wonder if, if anyone is really familiar with this or if we work through a basic level, but in 2013, Japan really came up with a revolutionary framework for regulatory of advanced cell therapies. And there's two pathways. There's a, what's called the Act on the Safety of Regenerative Medicine Act, or the RM Act. And then there's the Act on the Pharmaceuticals and Medical Devices. They're very uh, linked, but the RM Safety Act is less stringent. And um, you can get to the point where you can charge cash payments for your therapy but in order to get the Japanese health insurance to cover your, your therapy, you have to go through the PMD Act, which is what I recommend to all clients, is to go through the PMD Act. Because in Japan as well, it's a very conservative nation, as you know, and they're not used to paying cash for any sort of medical uh, treatments. So although it's available, it's not that active, and it's also um, a little bit frowned on. You kind of look like you're cutting corners, even though it's a really legal and not cutting corners, but it's still just not as uh, on the, you know, seen as on the up and up as working through the he Japanese health insurance. And Japanese health insurance actually pays really well as well for most of these therapies. So it's the it's it's the it's it's pathway I recommend. And again, just to go over compared to the United States, the advanced, you know, the regenerative medicine products are defined similar to the U.S. products, the, c the cellular and tissue-based products, and similar to the advanced therapy medicinal products in Europe. They're uh, gene therapy products, and they are, you know, cell therapy products that are more than minimally manipulated. And that's what qualifies you as an advanced cell therapy. Uh, this chart is a flow chart on how you could define your cell therapy. And mostly, we're going to end up in class one as an allogeneic cell therapy source. And there's a little bit different criteria between class one and class two, but it's not, di it's not incredibly that uh, different. However, in class one, this is the process. So when you work in the Japanese system, you really have to find a hospital partner to work with. And in that hospital system, they have a certified special committee on regenerative medicine. And that's the starting point. You find a hospital and a certified committee that approves your study design and says, yeah, we'll take on this, this study under our hospital. 
and at which point then you can go to the Minister of Health and Labor, which will approve the study, and then you can go back to the hospital and uh, conduct that study. And then at the end of the study, you do the submission as a, a regenerative medicine product or a P PMD. Now this is the most important slide of the entire presentation. And this is what separates the Japanese system, is that you get this conditional term limited approval. So after you conduct the phase one safety trial, you get market authorization under a conditional approval. You continue to operate your study as a phase two and phase three clinical trial. You do the same, you know, the same rigor of phase two, phase three trial, but at this point, you can begin to get reimbursement from the Japanese health insurance to cover the cost of phase two and phase three if you're in the PMD pathway. And if you're in the regenerative medicine pathway, you can continue to get cash payments to cover the phase two and phase three. So we know the cost of clinical trials. Phase one is about $2 million. Phase two is about $25 million. And phase three can go up to $250 million. So when we're looking at the cost of getting to market approval, with an investment of two, two and a half million dollars, you can get into a pathway that then the insurance can cover the real heavy expenses of phase two and phase three. And what I like about the Japanese system is that we're not going to a country where you can really cut corners. The Japanese system is top-notch medical, and the, the rigor of science is equal to anywhere in the, in the world. So you're not delivering you know, a data set that comes out of you know, a backwoods uh, hospital in Russia or something like that. You're, you're delivering a real first class, first world data set that then you can bring back to the United States. And what I advise my clients is that you may have to do with some additional uh, additions to the data set to make it an FDA approved data. But if you're even investing a few more million dollars throughout the course of the phase two and phase three trials, that's quite a savings in, in the big picture of getting a data set for phase three. And again, this, just, this shows the difference of the, the PMD Act and the Regenerative Medicine Act, which I went, went through, but in, you know, the PMD Act enables you to get the insurance to cover it, and the RM, you move into private practice cash payments. Whoa. All right. So for any company-sponsored trial, most of the aspect of that trial is covered under insurance, potentially, um, other than like the first examination and the imaging and things like that. So there's a few expenses, but in the big picture, it's pretty minimal. Again, this is a pretty detailed slide, but mostly it's number seven that you want to look at. The approved regenerative medicine products are covered by the national health insurance. Uh, this is an example of the first product to go through this pathway, which was a uh, Terumio product for heart sheet. And in this study, to get there, I mean, this is a Japanese company and they had some advantages, let's be, be honest about that. But they also had to do only seven subjects in the safety study to get to that conditional approval. And then at which point they got, for, for each patient, they still get $122,000 per patient for the, the payment for the phase two and phase three studies. And then, you know, you're going to the market, you're still marketing approval, but you're still conducting the clinical trial. Now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and give an example of Prochymal, uh, which was original, the Osiris Therapeutics uh, expanded bone marrow for uh, acute graft versus host disease that does not respond to steroids. So, and that product, that, that IP suite and the product was sold to Mesoblast, renamed it to Remstemel, and then they licensed it to JCR Pharmaceuticals, who renamed it to Temcel, but this is the same drug that we're gonna be talking about if I mix and match the names. We're talking about the, the expanded bone marrow prochymal drug that came out of Osiris. Now prochymal is expanded bone marrow derived MSC product to treat acute graft versus host disease in children unresponsive to steroids. Now I, I think most of you are familiar with what acute graft versus host disease is, but it's when after you, a child has had cancer or leukemia and has undergone uh, a chemotherapy or radiation treatment and then has this cord blood or a stem cell transplant and the graft is not accepted by the host. And that's, that's essentially what, what graft versus host disease is. And steroids is the first line of defense on that. And if steroids are unresponsive, then 
this drug has great effect um, in treating graft-first-host disease, which is a very debilitating disease as well. You get a lot of uh, blisters and le um, lesions all over the skin, and it has a 90% mortality rate as well. So we're talking about children who already had cancer and then get graft-first-host disease, and this is the, the drug that could really poten potentially have a high rate of uh, treating that disease, otherwise there's a 90% mortality rate. So it's a you know, population that you would think we'd really want to help. So the, the history of OSIRIS uh, was founded in 1993. In 2008, uh, the FDA initiated the expanded access for Proclimal, and they began you know, phase three clinical trials and in 2012, it was approved by Health Canada and has been used in Health Canada since then uh, with great results. And when it was approved in Health Canada, you know, this was really a monumental uh, milestone in the stem cell space. And we really thought that stem cell treatments were going to start getting approved, you know, one after the other. And our good friend Randy Mills, the former founder of, uh, former CEO of Osiris and the chief executive of CIRM gave this quote that today is not only a great day for Osiris, but for everyone involved in the responsible development of stem cell therapies. Most importantly, today is a great day for children and their family who bravely face this horrific disease. Well, today marks the first approval of a stem cell drug. Now that th that door has been opened, it will surely not be the last. Now, this is significant because this drug is still not approved in the United States. Uh, Further down, this is some of the business component. You know, after that license, they sold, Osiris sold their IP suite and the drug, all their mesenchymal IP to Mesoblast. Mesoblast licensed it to JCR Pharmaceuticals in Japan, and then JCR Pharmaceuticals uh, got the national health insurance reimbursement set up for their new, for their, what they renamed the drug Temcel in Japan. So, Basically, for every time that they use this prochymal to treat a child with acute graft versus host disease, they get reimbursed at a rate of uh, $110,000 per patient. And then, you know, this resulted in Celgene investing in mesoblasts, and everything looked great, and they expected, you know, the United States market to follow and really to become a great use of, of helping these children first and foremost. Uh, but unfortunately, that didn't happen, and Mesoblast submitted a, a, a BLA to, F, to the FDA in 2019, and even and in 2021, they got a complete response letter. Even though the advisory committee voted 9 to 1 to approve, they still sent back Mesoblast to go do another clinical trial, uh, which definitely, you know, to be honest, resulted in the deaths of a lot of children, because this is data that has been clearly shown in multiple other countries to be effective. And FDA just still wanted another round of, of data, which was really ridiculous. Um, what's, what's coming up on this is, uh, this is a quote from Joanne Kurtzberg about how, you know, a PD, one of the leading pediatric oncologists in the world, about how this drug would really be effective in, in helping her patients. Um, and what's really interesting is that Mesoblast selected not to do an additional clinical trial, but really to repackage the data set that they've collected from their Japanese uh, partner, and they've submitted that, and we expect a decision from FDA in August of this summer um, to approve it. And I would expect an approval, which will also really demonstrate the fact that you can package Japanese data and bring it to the U.S. for submission. Um, this is an interesting business look at how the business of this. If you're a company, why would you want to do this as well? Now, this is a mesoblast uh, company, you know, SEC, SEC filing, and their revenue, they made $7.6 million in 2021 from the licensing, licensing deal to JCR Pharma, Pharmaceuticals. And then in 2022, from that licensing deal, they made $8.7 million. Now, this is mesoblast's entire revenue from the licensing deal to JCR Pharmaceuticals. Now, I don't know, the licensing deal is confidential, the royalty rate, but I put it at 25%, which is probably higher than it actually is, and that would mean that JCR made a return of about 23 million in 2021 and about 26 million in 2022, 
uh, just in the Japanese market. I mean, the Japanese market is one of the, fi the fifth largest economy in the world. It's, it's not a tiny market. So this is just if you bring your technology to Japan and don't even package the data to come back to the US, just working in Japan is a very beneficial opportunity for, for many companies. You know, Miso Blast, this is their entire revenue for these two years. Uh, and, you know, they have a market cap of over $500 million, and their stock price is $3 a share, $3.60 a share or so this morning. Um, so what we can do is I have connections and have set up a pathway. Uh, this slide didn't really come translate, but I work with a partner called he, um, Biogentium Japan, and we can help your stage, your stage one company to access the Japanese pathway, work through, work through hospitals in Japan, and do your clinical trials in Japan working with my company, Hiwa Bushido. Uh, many of you may know Professor Takahashi, He's an incredibly well-respected uh, professor. He is one of the founders of Asia Cord um, and NetCord, and uh, is, he's the, the president of Biogentium Japan, who I work with. Uh, generally, these are the main hospitals that we work with, the uh, Fukushima Medical Center and the Tokyo Metropolitan Institute of Geratology. And you may remember the Fukushima Medical Center was where the radiation after the tidal wave, and Japan really pumped a lot of money back into restoring that area, and they have like six amazing, beautiful first-class hospitals there where they're really open to doing a lot of, a lot of uh, really interesting clinical trials. And again, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. I know we're going to have a panel come up on the same topic now, so maybe it makes sense to just move into the panel so we stay on time. But I appreciate you all coming to my talk, and you know, this is one avenue I've seen as a way to get these therapies to patients in a, in a way that companies can actually survive to make that pathway. So thank you for your time.